Thanks for coming. Um, I don't have a huge update on the Raiders. Uh, other than Curtis Hunt guaranteed we'd win the Memorial Cup next year. So you can take that, you can hold him to that. I've been at a few of these things and I really don't want to talk about anything too in depth. Everyone's just trying to wake up. So I'll just tell you a couple stories from my illustriously average career, hockey career so far. Uh, a couple little things was I played 13 years pro and I moved 65 times, which is true. I can go through the whole 13 years, move 65 times, and in 12 years of uh, school, my kids moved or went to 10 different schools. So that's the type of uh, career you have in this stupid game. Uh, <clears throat> Story from my playing career, I guess, was when I first started. I started with the uh, with the mighty oil that are moving right along now, so that's good to see. But back in the day, we always took instead of the charters, the big uh, big time planes. Now, we used to take um, commercial flights. <clears throat> so we happened to be going through uh, Detroit at this time. I think we were going to Boston, so we flew from wherever Edmonton to Detroit, connected, and went on to Boston. And we were going by the this gate, and the Red Wings were were um, just on their route, they were catching a flight wherever, so they were at their gate. Kind of walked by, and at this time I was 19 years old, I really didn't know what was going on, but uh, the Red Wings were sitting at their gate, and they had this guy, this young guy there, he was just starting with the Red Wings, his name was Adam Oates, and he was, he signed for some big dollars, so he had the, the nice suits, the Giorgio Armani suits, the Hugo Boss suits, uh, the real fine stuff, but from we had what we had gathered, he was, fairly confident, so to speak. And Detroit at that time had a lot of uh, old guys playing, like Harold Schnapps, and I think Reed Larson was there. They had a bunch of older guys. And the older guys, I don't think, took too kindly to a young guy coming in and having Armani suits and kind of having a lot of confidence, so to speak. So we were walking by the gate, and they, they had Adam Oates's suit bag hung up, opened, with about 10 of these suits moved along and I think it was Harold Schnapps, he was the auctioneer. <laughs> Adam Oates wasn't there, by the way, and Harold Schnapps was having a little auction. So he was auctioning off all of Adam Oates's nice Armani suits to whoever wanted them surrounding the gate and I think they got 150 bucks for about 10 Armani suits. And then about three of the older guys went to uh, have a little lunch on Adam Oates. <laughs> That was the way it was back in the day. One of the best people I uh, played with, or uh, not played with, but coached with, I was fortunate enough to work with uh, Pat Quinn, God rest his soul. And uh, he was just a real good, honorable guy. He uh, loved his steaks, he loved his red wine, he loved his cigars. And he was probably one of the most superstitious men I'd ever seen. He was a quiet, laid back guy. And I remember in the Olympics in Torino, Andy Moog was the coaching, uh, was the goalie coach. And Pat always had his gum. You could do anything with Pat, but just leave his gum. So before the game, he had his three pieces of gum laid out. So Andy didn't know this, so Andy came in and there's the gum. Went to grab the gum and I swear Pat was gonna rip his arm off. He just grabbed it and Andy didn't know what was gonna happen, but that was the only time I saw Pat get upset. But Pat was a great storyteller, and I'll just relay. This isn't my story, this is Pat's story, but this is one of the, the better ones that I've heard. When he was in Vancouver, his wife wanted to live in North Van. So uh, Pat got the record straight, so she wanted to live in North Van. Pat was going to buy in North Van. So Pat bought this place in North Vancouver, and it was kind of uh, uh, tiered a little bit. And he had a great kind of view in the uh, look overlooking downtown Vancouver. There's just one problem though, the neighbor below had these huge cedars. And so Pat would look out his back window and all he could see with the, was these cedars. So he was saying, geez, it'd be nice. He said, all I need is 10 feet. If I could just, those trees were 10 feet shorter, I'd have a, you know, not a great view, but he said I could have just enough view to see downtown. Okay. So uh, he went down to the neighbor and the neighbor recognized him right away and he said, you know, I don't want to, I understand they're your trees and stuff, but you know, if I could just, just 10 feet. 
then I could just peek over the top and I could just see downtown and it'd be perfect. And the guy agreed to it, no problem. So Pat went and he called the, uh, a uh, landscaping company, set it up, just to cut 10 feet off. So uh, he had waited a week and nothing happened. Waited another week, nothing happened. So he thought, you know what, they probably forgot. So I'll, cut, I'll just call a, uh, another landscaping company. He said, when can you come? And Pat was phoning him in the morning. He said, yeah. He says, I'll, uh, we'll be there uh, tomorrow morning, first thing. And he said, no problem. He says, I'm going golfing. That'll work out perfect. So Pat uh, came, and the, tree, or the landscaping company came. First thing in the morning, they cut off 10 feet. Pat's at the golf course, didn't know. When you know it, the next landscaping crew came in, came in the afternoon. He said, cut it off another 10 feet. He said, at that time, I had the best view going in Vancouver or downtown. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, two little stories there. Just about, this is all about the Special Olympics. We really appreciate you coming out. Um, my first experience with Special Olympics was from a young man in Edmonton, and he's become kind of an icon up there by the name of Joey Moss. And Joey was uh, rink at, or the dressing room attendant for us up there, and, and everyone talks about how, um, how, you know, about the big guys everybody knows about and how great those teams were, myself excluded. I was just a part there for a short time. But uh, how important Joey was to the group. Um, he really was. He was there every day. He was a smile on his face, worked, uh, kept a real good balance with the group, and uh, he's been a big part of that team, and not only that team, but that community. So thanks for supporting Special Olympics, and uh, um, enjoy your breakfast. Before we get the guys from Special Olympics, all the athletes, why don't you take a stand up here first of all right now. Get a good look at you here. Let's give them a round of applause, everybody. So up next, our uh, speaker from uh, Special Olympics, uh, Mr. Dubois. Ed Dubois, please come on up here. Good morning, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your breakfast. Um, thanks, Mark, for making it difficult for me to speak after that act. Um, I would like to... Special Olympics is, is a great program. Um, it gets them out and acting and participating in these events. And uh, it's dear to my heart. I have a son who's a Special Olympic, Olympian myself. So uh, it's, once again, give these guys a hand because they work harder than we actually think. I'd like to thank a few people for attending today. Uh, Jordan and Dan with the Rough Riders organization. Uh, as we all know, the riders are a class act, and it's much appreciated that they're here today. Uh, thanks to all our sponsors who have bought tables, and I hope they continue to do so throughout the years. Um, special thanks to our major sponsor, Scotiabank. Uh, without them, this might not be happening, and this is their second year doing this and I hope they continue to participate in this, this great program. Uh, all the volunteers who came out and worked hard to make this thing happen, without them, well, we might not be here and eating the good eats that we have. Uh, lastly, last but not least, I'd like to thank the Prince Albert Raiders uh, for their continued support. Uh, they've been great all the way from Special Olympics night to autism awareness. Um, they're hands-on with the community for sure. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to thank Mike and Mike, the dynamic duo. Stand up, Mike and Mike. <laughs> Mike's probably had a few sleepless nights the last few days, and I bet he'll be glad when things are over. Uh, just one more point to make. Uh, in ju on June 16th is the Provincial Olympics um, competition held in Moose Jaw. And we have several athletes from the area going down uh, to participate in this. If they kick some butt, which I know they will, because they're from the Prince Albert Lakeland area, uh, they'll be moving on to nationals. And if they kick butt there, they'll be going to world. So yeah, th this is ultimate for them, and it's awesome to see them there. Um, the following student, uh, students, athletes are, uh, if they're here, can they please stand up? Adrian Jones. Barb Weeb, Brianna Bear, James Graham, 
and Karina Mason. They're all going down for bowling. Uh, Trevor Fendelet is going down for golf. And uh, my son, Dylan Dubois, who's not feeling well today, he'll be going down through Saskatoon for softball. Um, this is, once again, a great opportunity for them. Uh, I'm going down as mission staff, and it, it's great. I'd like to thank outgoing co-chair Darren Whitehead, who showed me the ropes and how to get things done. Give him a big round of applause. And all the Special Olympics staff who have uh, worked hard with these athletes to get them where they're going. Raise your hand so we know who you are. That means you, Jack. <laughs> and Darren and Amber. Where's Amber? Right there. Mike, Taryn, they've all helped out even as the parents. They're uh, key contributors to our program to keep it going. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. I think we're gonna go for the raffles. Thank you again for coming out. So yeah, like I said, the next part of the program will be the the, uh, the new look riders. Now, are there going to be issues with cohesion this year? Uh, from my standpoint, uh, I've been with the team going on in nine years. So I've seen a lot of new faces come in and out. But the thing about uh, the guys that they've brought in uh, this year is they're established. Uh, you look at Derek Dennis, lineman of the year. Chad Owens, he's been an MVP in the year uh, in the league before. Um, these are guys that... Uh, want to win and want to continue to have a culture of winning and that's something that we need and want. Um, it's definitely hasn't shown in the last two years but it's definitely something that uh, it's going to continue to trend in the locker room. Um, through all of our struggles last year uh, we uh, we came together as a team we may not have looked at the field and the score didn't show it but it was definitely something the team we felt like a team instead of being 5-13 the locker room felt like we were 13-5 so what was the emotion like, I guess, in the locker? Like I said, you, you had a tough year last year. We all watched it, unfortunately. Uh, very, very so, unfortunate. I mean, on the field, though, how do you guys stay up when you know, times are down like that? And when you're talking amongst yourselves, how does the team keep cohesion? How do you even talk about that? I don't know. To be honest with you, I think it's just uh, you know, a lot of the character that we have in the room. You know, I know at least in my first year, two years ago, you know, we had uh, great leadership. Guys like Rob Bag. I mean, you can't say nothing about guys like him. Uh, and Dan Clark and, and Chris Best and all these guys, good character guys. And you know, you know, we were 315, and then last year, you know, record being what it was, we, we were still off. And we were always, we always look forward, coming to work the next day, had fun, and uh, you know, it was always very, very positive. So it never felt like we were having a losing, se losing season, even though the record was what it was. We, uh, we all just enjoyed coming to work and, and being around each other, so it definitely helped. Now, we have a lot of riders, uh, season ticket holders up here in the north as well. Uh, a lot of us are going to be going down to see the brand new Mosaic Stadium this year. Have you guys had a chance to tour the facility yet? Uh, favorite parts? Um, is this going to be a, a positive for the team? Uh, for myself, uh, I've, I've toured it from then pouring concrete um, all the way to the finished product. So it's definitely something that's it's Taj Mahal of stadiums. Um, we talked to some of the American guys that come in. Um, especially a guy like Willie Jefferson who's seen a lot of stadiums in the NFL and he said they don't touch what we've got and it's it's amazing it's there's no bad seat in the house um, small little tidbit our scoreboard's the size of an NBA court so it reaches numbers to numbers which is pretty cool uh, for us we're spoiled rotten from barbershop to underwater treadmill to cold tubs our gyms together but for me my coolest part um, I'm really big on family and making sure that the team and the organization is like a family. We're all together. Previously, we had three locations. One was a business, our business office, one was our uh, workout facility, and one was the stadium, but now we're all together. Um, and plus, we're bringing football staff with us to be on, I believe, on the third floor with us. So it just brings the family aspect back and makes sure that we're all together. I think what you're saying is we have no excuses to <laughs> we, all, we all heard that, right? No excuses this year. So we both Saskatchewan boys. Uh, what's it mean, I guess, for you to play for the Riders and, and play on Taylor Field, um, being from Saskatchewan? Does it mean more, being from here at home? Yeah, it means everything. It's, it's honestly the best feeling in the world. You know, I've played on other places, played in the States and stuff like that. And even though, you know, it kind of was what it was, and, you know, in the NFL and all this stuff, 
coming back home, there's nothing like it. You know, being in Saskatchewan and, and growing up and playing with the Hilltops and then the Rams and then being on that field at Taylor Field, you know, play with the Rough Riders team, grew up watching it, it means everything. And it's, there's, there's no other feeling like it. And it's uh, where I want to be for, for a very long time. So I know I'm assuming the feels the same way. Uh, ben, now you've had a chance to play uh, your junior football in Regina. With the success that's been with the Rams, uh, Hilltops, Huskies programs, uh, as well as programs we have here in PA. What do you think makes Saskatchewan such a great breeding ground for football? Uh, I would say it's, we're resilient. Whether it be the weather that brought us into this, of course, what we deal with every day, but I think it's, it's came from generation from generation to generation. It's the resilience. Um, it's, it's our sports teams. We, we seem to fight no matter what. We always want to be able to have the best of the best and be able to produce the best of the best. And for me, it's always having um, home is where my heart is, and that's why I want to stay in Saskatchewan. Um, but sports in Saskatchewan is such a big thing. You look at programs coming up to be able to help student athletes to be able to become better athletes, but also keep them students. And that's something that you know we strive to be able to still have in the province of Saskatchewan. Maybe we each kind of talk a little bit about your journey to becoming a rider. Uh, was that something you always thought about maybe doing? Was it uh, something you maybe strive for? Uh, well, talk for about? myself, my dad asked me at a young age, what do you want to do? And I looked at myself, I want to be a professional athlete. He's like, okay. Um, <laughs> so he asked me in high school, so okay, what do you want to do? I said, I still want to be a professional athlete. Okay, well, let's focus up. Let's, let's see what you, let's, let's see your path and let's go from there. So my path from junior football and um, kind of skipping the whole college thing. When I first got to Riders, I was, I was just happy to be there. I was just a, you know, a kid from the junior team, 19 years old, ready to kind of go on a journey. And uh, it was taking a lot of definite hard work. Um, I was on the PR for three years, so that definitely takes a toll on, you know, can I do this? Will I be able to succeed? Um, but the thing that keeps bringing me back every day is that my heart, my determination, um, whether it be getting up at 3.30 in the morning to go train before I have an appearance or have to be able to go speak to kids, but it's it's that want and drive. Until I don't get those butterflies running on that stadium, it, it's over, but for now, it's every day. I love the grind. Yeah, and I mean, for me, you know, uh, as soon as I, you know, decided that I want to be a pro football player, which was kind of later, it was in midway through high school, um, you know, I knew, you know, I want to play for riders one day, it was, it was everything, right? So. Played at the Hilltops, and then you know I was like 19 or 20, and I actually got called in for a workout with the Riders, and Ken Miller was still the head coach. And it was a rainy, crappy, cold, cold spring day, and uh, had a terrible workout, and uh, didn't hear from him again. But it was uh, one of the coolest phone calls I remember ever getting. Um, it was from one of the recruiting guys after I just wrote a final at the U of S. And um, you know after then I had that workout, I knew that's where I wanted to be. So I worked my tail off all university. And, Hope to get back one day, and, and it ended up working out. But it's uh, you know, you, you grow up watching on TV, and you eventually, you know, you want to be there, and you, you just work your tail off to hope to get there someday. Now, today we're also recognizing our Special Olympics athletes. Maybe you could pass on some advice to uh, some of our young athletes. Uh, what's the key to success? Uh, for me, my key to success for myself and last, I would say, since I grew up in the football world, would be preparation. Um, whether it be working for your body, um, making sure that you're doing all the little things right, um, whether it be recovery um, for myself. But the biggest thing that's helped me along, helped me become starters, uh, is understanding the game, making sure you know what's going on, um, making sure that when you're up by seven points and the team's doing a drive to win, the other team's doing a drive to win the game, you're not too, you're not too high with that. You're, you're focused on if you get the ball back, what are you going to do? And that's something that preparation has always been a big key for me and it's always helped me is understanding of, okay, what's the defense going to give me? What what can I expect? So preparation and heart, it's always things that kept me together. Yeah, I think uh, preparation, uh, hard work, obviously physically and mentally, but also like staying in check mentally and just staying, um, you know, driven. And um, you know I'm a I'm a huge uh, Navy SEAL fanatic, and I love reading up on their stuff, and I love the way their, their minds work and their mindset. There's a, a saying that I always say to myself to remind myself, you know, on days where I wake up sore, tired, um, and it's to get comfortable being uncomfortable. So you know, on the days that you know everyone else wants to just shut her down and, and not go to work, you know, you gotta mentally stay locked in and, and do it. 
Uh, one more for me. If I was to talk to your teammates and describe something crazy or wacky about you guys, uh, how would they describe your character if you think the boys in the locker room? Uh, uh, probably loud and annoying. <laughs> Actually, our, uh, our puncher, we were, uh, we were in Ottawa, we were very lucky to have a 10-day trip. He goes, Dan, i got to bet for you. And I'm like, what? He goes, I bet you can't be quiet for a week. <laughs> and I'm like, that's going to be easy. Well, the first day after practice, I was so loud. I'm like, oh, yeah, Labatt's like, Dan, $20 a month. you got to be quiet. I was like, all right. It's one thing that hurt. Uh, I was very quiet and shy my first couple of years, and I kind of fell. I kind of fell on my shell and I've been loud, trying to make sure that everybody knows where I'm at and what I'm doing. But it's also uh, making sure I welcome guys to the locker room. Um, a new guy, whether he be there for 20 minutes for a little workout, I always extend my hand. Hi, I'm Dan Clark, nice to meet you. My locker's over there. If you need anything, grab anything, it's, it's open. So it's, it's definitely something that my loud and obnoxious personality that I have sometimes to the guys, uh, it's definitely something that I hopefully brings life and has everybody have fun. Yeah, and Dan's good. That uh, makes everybody feel at home right away. Um, did that to me my first day with the Riders, I remember. Um, as far as what people think of me, I think, um, you know, nice guy trying to welcome everybody. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not as loud as uh, talking to this Dan is in the locker room. I don't think anybody quite is. Macho Harris tried to top him one year, and Dan put him the rest pretty, pretty <laughs> But you know, people, you know, us special team guys, you know, me, this now really fine with kicker. People don't really mess with us too much because we have the most time out of anyone on the team, so we can go to their lockers and do whatever we need to. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, come to Nancy. Uh, got time for a, a few quick questions. Anybody in the crowd have a question for uh, Druggett or Dan? Just kind of raise your hand here quick. In the back, yes. When is Dan going to score his next, next touchdown? Probably never. <laughs> uh, I've, kind of, I've kind of come to the terms of I'm very comfortable with my hand on the ball now and snapping it. So I, uh, um, I would love to score another one. Uh, I just I don't know if it's going to come anytime that I'm playing center. So anybody else? Sure. Give me two answers. How did you guys feel? Did you want to say a lot of what she asked She said, uh, how, do, how did we feel after we lost Darian Durant? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jordan and I are both involved with the Red Cross and the Imagine Noble Building Program. This is probably my favorite question to answer. So, as a person that's paid by the writers, um, it, <laughs> it, uh, as Darian is a young man that came in about 11 years ago, it, uh, it gave him the opportunity to be able to become a leader and to be able to develop into a quarterback to lead an organization for over a decade. As a player that looks up to Darian as a big brother, I felt terrible. Uh, we lost the leader, we lost the guy that puts it all in line every day, every game. Uh, we lost the guy in the locker room that, you know, brings us together, uh, makes sure that he's involved. Uh, we also lost the guy that's a, a huge in the community, uh, whether it be helping with football programs or whether it be, you know, even developing young guys in the locker room. So um, on a personal level, I thought it was stupid, but that's just my personal opinion. <laughs> Jordan, do you want anything? Our special guest this morning, go Riders, right? So this time, I'd like to once again thank the Raiders organization for putting on breakfast this morning. Our sponsors, Scotia, Mr. Plummer, Kin Enterprises, River Park Funeral Home, the Broder Group, Frank Dunn Toyota. Thank you so much for your support this morning. Everybody have a great day. Hopefully the snow is gone. Thanks very much.